Welcome back to the Design, Creativity and Technology channel. My name's Aaron. In today's video, I'd like to share with you my top 10 common mistakes made by Fusion 360 users. And these are mistakes that I've come across during my time as an educator and or vocational trainer. Now, these are common mistakes made by many CAD users. And even though my focus today is on Fusion 360, these could easily be transferred across to other CAD software packages. To make it easier for you, I'll include a topic selection and timeline so you can jump forward or back in any of the topics I present here today. Not to mention, I'll also give credit where credit is due to those who showed me the error of my CAD ways. Before you go about your design, you've really got to ask yourself a few serious questions. So what is it you're trying to make? How are you going to make it? What process are you going to use to make it? For example, are you going to use subtractive manufacturing process? Or are you going to use an additive process? Is it a single part? Is it a multiple part? Is it a main assembly or a sub-assembly? How would you like it displayed when you take it into a 2D drawing? Should you use parameters? Or shouldn't you use parameters? Which sketch plane to start off in? Now these are all common questions asked by the novice or even the seasonal CAD user. I highly recommend that when you start your design that your first point of contact with your mouse uh, for whatever it is you're trying to sketch is actually the center point which is called the origin. If you snap to the origin you will anchor that point there okay and the sketch won't move from that anchored point and that's the first starting point and I strongly suggest you do this is snap to origin. So my second topic here today is underdefined sketches. Many, many times I come across students who get um, they can't get their 2D drawings right, their measurements are incorrect, only to go back to their 3D model to find some very simple common problems such as an underdefined sketch. So what are underdefined sketches? Okay, so if we look at this rectangle I drew here, you'll notice that the left hand line and the bottom line are black. Uh, black is good, okay? Blue is bad. Blue is underdefined and we need to fix that. Now a simple way to fix this today, as you can see, would be put a dimension on it. So I can put a dimension on the bottom and a dimension to the side. And once I lock that in, you'll notice that the sketch turns black, which means it's fully defined. The other reason we keep fully defined sketches is because Throughout your model, when you try to rebuild the model by clicking play on the timeline, if you have underdefined sketches, Fusion will want to go back and calculate that all the time. If they're fully defined, it doesn't have to recalculate that. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kevin Ellingson for that tip. So topic three I'd like to talk to you about is uh, when and where to use parameters. And for those that haven't used parameters before, they live up here under Modify. And you come all the way down to the bottom where we can change parameters. So this little model here is an interesting little model. It's very, very basic in its design. And it's a model that I use to show students or an introduction to joints, especially, and also to parameters. Now, this model was, this one whole model here was designed off these simple three parameters here. So you can see I've named my parameters thickness grid and holes, okay? And if we take a look at that sketch at the very, very start, you can see my basic sketch uh, consists obviously of a square and a grid pattern within that square. Now, parameters are represented by the letter FX in front of them. And so they link anything with FX links back to that parameter. And you can also link dimensions to uh, other dimensions within a sketch as well, but I'm not gonna talk about that here in this video. Now, a good design, when you use design intent properly, I should be able to change my parameters and this model shouldn't fall over and it should work. So if I come down here to modify, change parameters, and I'll change my grid pattern here uh, to 40, and I'll click OK. And you can see that my model is updated. Okay, so I'll change the thickness of the material now, and uh, let's make that 10 mil plastic. Uh, so what I usually do with this, after the students design it, uh, we take it into the laser cutter and they get to cut out their shape and glue them together and keep their dice, all right? Uh, we can also alter the holes, so the size of the holes in this model. So we'll change those to eight. And 
and as you can see my model hasn't fallen over and it's still all in one piece and uh, everything works fine. So that's a good example of when to use parameters and uh, within your design you don't have to use parameters all the time but it makes it easier if it's a part you're going to mass produce and you may want to change the size of it. So a really good design that I saw of this a long time ago was by an Autodesk employee called Taylor Stein and Taylor designed a desktop laptop stand uh, which you laser cut and depending on your parameter you set up you can change your material size and bang hit enter and it up updates and populates the new model so it's a really really good tip. So the next topic I'm going to use is patterns and when to do those patterns. Now we should always use patterns in the feature and not in the sketch. And the reason we do that is because when we do a pattern as a feature, it's performing a Boolean operation. It doesn't have to do this huge mathematical calculation. Uh, I'm not going to go into what Boolean means. You can look that up yourself and uh, there's lots on the internet about that. Now here's my first one and, and I've done this uh, demo A and demo B. All right. Now demo A you can see that I've performed the pattern within the feature and in demo B you can't, I've got the same model, it looks identical okay but I've performed the pattern in the sketch. Now there's pros and cons to this, like I was saying before if you do it in, if you do it in the feature it's a boolean operation uh, when I've done it in the sketch, I can't really modify that now. Okay, it's there to stick. The only, the only way to modify it if I did it in the sketch is come back to the sketch here. I'd have to delete what I did previously, okay, um, and then reapply that feature. Where simply, if I do it within the feature, I can come back to this quite easily, edit the feature, and I can change that from five to six holes to five holes and update the model very, very quickly. But more importantly, to prove the point, and now this, like as I was saying, this is a tip that I got off Kevin Ellingson. And let's look up here in my downloads, and let's just get some file sizes here for, a, for you to have a look at. If we look at the file size of these two documents here, okay, uh, 10A, so this demo, the first demo I showed you where I did the pattern within the feature, uh, take a look at the size of the file. Now if you have a look where I've done the pattern in the sketch, it's interesting to note that it's actually a bigger file. Uh, and if we just take one more look at that model again, you'll see there's a lot more going on in the timeline down here than there is in this one here. But it's interesting to note that this file size is actually bigger than when I performed the pattern inside the feature. For tip number five, I'm going to suggest that you use the hole command over sketching holes and then extruding them. Now the reason we do that is because Fusion knows the proper size to build based on the fasteners you want to use. For example, it may be a through hole, you might want a countersunk hole, counterbore hole, uh, maybe even a tapped hole. In this example here, you'll see me working on a simple T-nut design uh, where I insert a threaded hole. Additionally, when you use the whole feature, this is going to help in your 2D drawings as well because eventually Fusion will suck across any information that you create in the parametric model uh, into the drawing notes. Uh, additionally, you can also, in the cam, Fusion will see that that is now a tapped hole and I can pop in there with a, with a tap and rigid tap that hole to the correct size. So topic number six is about fixing any yellow that you have in your timeline. Now these yellow could be attached to a feature or to a sketch. Now yellow means that usually the yellow means that you've lost a reference. Okay, So down in here you'll see my CNC machine table that I drew in Fusion 360. And rarely I have this happen to me but I exported this then brought it back into Fusion. And it gave me this error down below, and I think it could have been, I originally had this built with the vice and everything on it. So if I come down to the timeline, right click on it and go review the warning, and it actually tells you, look, you've lost a reference. So there's zero distance in there, okay? So you need to fix that. Even though Fusion's rebuilt that model and everything looks fine, trust me, don't go ahead, go back and fix the model. And this is a common mistake I find uh, when I teach students and also adults for that matter and other teachers that they have this in the timeline, they don't quite understand it. And they don't go back to fix it because they, 
they think, well, look, the model's still there. I'll just leave it. Everything's good. Well, it's not. <laughs> so if I come down here, right-click on here, and go edit my feature, you can see there that Fusion's lost the reference for the extrusion. Now, to, to rectify that, if I type in negative 400 millimeters, and as soon as I click OK, the model re will rebuild, and everything's fine. When I press play in the timeline, you can actually see the strategy or the method I used here to do this. And there we have it. And once again, you saw me uh, mirroring those features and not doing it in the sketch. Okay. The next topic I want to take a look at is a common one. Now, I used to do this and it was a habit. It was probably an old habit that I brought in from the PTC days when I used uh, Pro Desktop and it was grounding. So here's my little steam engine that we do with my engineering students where they make one of these and it actually runs and works and you can actually rotate the flywheel and it will turn over but when I go to rotate it you can see that it moves away and I drop out a spring and that sort of thing. Now commonly a lot of people want to do this. They come to the base, they right click on it and they want to go uh, ground. Okay. And once I ground it, I think, oh, okay, everything's apple, should be right. But you want to stay away from grounding your part. You actually want to apply a joint. So when I designed this, I designed this in full top-down strategy, so I had other geometry driving other geometry, okay? And when I first drew the base and extruded it, I put a joint to the origin. And I'll turn that back on. I had it suppressed here, and I'll unsuppress that. And once again, you can see I'm back to where I am. So stick, stay away from using ground. Um, now, where I got this tip from was from Scott Moyes. Scott works, he's an Autodesk expert elite like Kevin uh, Ellingson. And uh, he works for CAD Pro. And Scott put a really good tweet, uh, well, not a tweet, actually a post on Instagram about why. And, uh, and, and this is the reason Scott was saying, see, the difference between using ground and rigid joints to anchor your first component in Autodesk Fusion 360 Ground is in a local state and doesn't survive instances of the components, whereas the joints are global and survive instancing. So I think that's a really, really good explanation, and uh, it got lots of lights from other people, especially from Marty and Autodesk, uh, uh, Tim, who's also from Autodesk as well, and of course myself. Now that brings us up to tip number eight today and uh, this is another common thing that I see a lot and it's, uh, I've actually titled this, this one Sketch to the Max and I'll show you why I've done this. So I've got two models here, the preferred model, you can see it's out but I'm going to explain why, and the Sketch to the Max model. So if we come in here and edit that sketch, all right, you can see that now this is very, very common. So it's, it's sort of a leftover from old-fashioned geometric drawing. So when you actually uh, used a drawing board and a T-square and set squares and where you did construction lines to find holes. So this is a bit of a hangover from those times. And uh, you usually find people around my vintage doing this. Uh, you know, we didn't learn CAD at high school. We learned old-fashioned hand drawing, technical drawing. And I didn't learn CAD until I was in my mid-30s. So... You can see here that they've got construction lines everywhere, they've put four circles, this is a basic, could be a blanking plate or something like that. Um, they've dimensioned every circle. The other thing they've done, their fillets in the sketch, and that's something I tend to shy away from these days. Anyway, we'll do finish, and look, although the model is built, and then they've gone in and, and threaded the holes, this is another common thing, I'll see them thread every single hole, instead of holding down the control key on a PC or the command key on a Mac and getting all those four in one hit. Now the preferred method is uh, this one here, I just simply uh, design the sketch, you know, do the sketch, put your dimensions on, it's fully defined, the lines are black, uh, extrude it, put my fillets on the side, and then come into here now and get start to get the hang of using constraints more. Okay, constraints live up here in the sketch palette and you know you've got uh, coincident, you've got uh, horizontal, vertical, tangent, equals, parallel, 90 degrees, perpendicular, okay, midpoints, all this sort of stuff. So a simple one that I find very, very useful and I use a lot is horizontal vertical. Now, all I've done here is put four points on my sketch and now I can just simply come in and one, two, that one is in line, one, two, that one there is in line, one, two, that's in line, 
then we want this one and that one to be in line and you can see now that I'm fully defined all my points are black so I know that's going to work finish sketch and what I did in here I used once again the hole wizard from the previous tip I told you about and in my hole wizard I told it to pick up those points that I put on there and straight away I want a tapped hole and everything like that and you can see what I mean it's a much neater I can come back at any time and change anything I wanted to uh, whereas before it's a little bit more difficult <music> The next thing I want to talk about is capture position. Okay, and this is very, this is quite common. It usually happens with, uh, you know, assemblies. And what they'll do, they'll import a lot of the, a lot of parts into one file, and then they'll want to start uh, assembling them. And they'll grab one and pull it out, and grab another one and pull it out to see it. And, and that's understandable. Uh, you want to do that. Uh, an, another way they could be doing is just simply just by turning off the eye, okay, instead of moving them. But anyway, when they move them out here, and then they go to hit joint, and it comes up with capture position. You want to stay away from capture position. It's just um, it's just eating up computer memory. And okay, and down the timeline, I've seen students with probably 14, 15, maybe even 20 capture positions, and they want to know why their their model's so slow. You know, when they're trying to rebuild it and that sort of thing. So. Try and stay away from capture position where possible. And this is, once again, this is, a, this is another tip from my good friend Kevin Ellingson, okay, from Mechanical Advantage. Okay, the final tip, the final finale, and, and this is probably really right down at number one, is always save your work before you start, all right? Uh, you'll, get, you'll see that in Fusion anyway. If you want to start doing an assembly, Fusion will prompt you to save your design before you start importing, uh, you know, other bodies and that sort of thing, okay? Um, all right, so when we're in here now, there's a couple of little, little tricks here. Uh, you'll notice that I've used a constraint in here, so this is building on from that constraint. So I've put an equal constraint here. So if I change that hole to 20, the other one will populate as well. A neat little trick and uh, that I saw recently, and uh, Kevin saw this from one of his students actually, that showed him, was how do you put an angle dimension on those, on those two holes? So you can do this quite simply by picking the points, one, two, three, and come out, and there you have your angle. So we can have there 125. That's a neat little trick. So another little trick I want to show you, and now this is something that I really mucked up in the early days of Fusion 360. And I actually did a video on it, and it was uh, how to draw a paper clip. And I do realise now, and, and most of you will know this tip, and it's not, you know, it's it's quite a simple one. And it's when you're sketching that if you're drawing a straight line, if you hold the mouse and then move out, you'll get an arc. Now, that took me, <laughs> you won't believe this, that took me a long time to master or to grasp, okay? And, of course, depending on the way you do it, you know, you can get different arcs and that sort of thing. Um bring this one back down here so L for line can continue up here and you may remember this paper clip that I did back in the day all right let's bring him down a little bit more all right and now we can finish sketch and pop back into our next one put a circle on there a little circle finish sketch he'll come back over and then we can sweep that and uh, as you can see, I've got an underdefined sketch. This is just a real quick one to show you guys, okay? The profile will be that one, and the path will be that, and there we have our basic paper clip, all right? So look, once again, hey, thanks for hanging in there. I hope you learned something. Um, feel free to comment below. I'm sure other Fusion 360 users will be uh, reading the comments, and, you know, if I can answer you, I will. If not, feel free to jump in the comments and uh, answer some of the questions yourself. Have a lovely day and uh, we'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye.